You are listening to The Addiction Files, where we discuss evidence-based treatment, clinical pearls and resources, while striving to destigmatize the treatment of addiction in our medical culture and save lives. We are the addiction doctors, Dr. Darlene Peterson and Paula Cook. All right. Welcome to this episode of The Addiction Files. We are thrilled. We have Dr. Alexander Katahakis joining us, and we are talking all about sex addiction. That we are, this is just going to be a fantastic episode. This is something where, as us as addiction doctors, really have some knowledge gaps, and we are here to just all learn together. And Dr. Katahakis is the founder and clinical director of Center for Healthy Sex in Los Angeles, recipient of the 2018 ITAP Leadership Award, and author of several books, including Sex Addiction as Affect Dysregulation, a Neurobiological Informed Holistic Treatment, the multiple award-winning Mirror of Intimacy, Daily Reflections, Reflections on Emotional and Erotic Intelligence, and Sexual Reflections and Erotic Intelligence. So it is our honor and our pleasure to welcome you to this episode. And let's just dive in. First, kind of let's talk about what is sex addiction? What is it not? And why why is that even definition controversial in the first place? Tell us about that. Well, that's a really good jumping off point, Darlene. You're right. I've been uh, working with people who identify as, quote, sex addicts since 1998. And I think if we think about the term sex addiction as a syndrome, um, right, there are a constellation of behaviors that people engage in that create destruction in their lives um, because of sex. And people always want to make fun of it, or they say, if I have any addiction, I want it to be sex. And Mm -hmm. I counter that with saying that people that struggle with this affliction are in excruciating pain. Um, they often have pretty severe early childhood trauma. So you probably know that I think in 2012, Um, the uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine started talking about sex addiction. And finally, the World Health Organization just last year recognized compulsive sexual behavior disorder as a diagnostic category in their international classification of diseases, what we know as the ICD-11. So they finally have legitimated this problem because I also noticed you had a a podcast on gaming, gambling, and internet addiction. And so we'll recognize that, but we don't want to recognize porn addiction, which is separate from sex addiction, but as tenacious as gaming or gambling ever is. It's the same mechanism in the brain. Um, And sex addiction, you know, historically hasn't been recognized because the clinical sexologists were just terrified that sex was going to be pathologized. Mm -hmm. Um, And they'd work so long and hard to incorporate sexual minorities into healthy sexual pictures and to give people a space to express sexuality in a myriad of ways, including you might remember that homosexuality was in the DSM at one point, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, sort of chilling and shocking. So that's a kind of snapshot of the morass of how there's been all this struggling with trying to define this thing without pathologizing sex, but also naming that people have very real compulsive problems with sex that destroys their lives. That's so interesting. And I was wondering if, it's this is uh, more on a microscopic level with people not really knowing if they have sex addiction or if it's such a thing, but they clearly struggle with these feelings of shame surrounding their compulsive behaviors in in the sexual realm, and they don't even know if it's a thing. I mean, yeah. Do you find that's true? Well, typically when people call Center for Healthy Sex, they've figured out that they're in trouble, they're in pain. They either can't get into a relationship repeatedly or they've destroyed a number of relationships, marriages. So they know that this is a chronic problem for them. But, you know, a lot of people don't know because the term now sex addiction gets bandied about and the same way we use the word crazy. Right. It doesn't mean anything anymore. So I would just suggest that people should consider, you know, like with any addiction, if you have messes in your life, what we call unmanageability. 
um, and they are repeated and you are the constant common denominator that you really might want to take a look at your intimacy issues, your ability to connect on a deeper level. Do you sexualize all of your feelings all the time? Are you using people to make yourself feel better? Um, there's a whole list of criteria that we follow to assess people to see if they really are struggling with this problem as opposed to, well, you know, my wife says I'm a sex addict. That's not a diagnostic criteria, <laughs> um, but there are very real things that we look at. And can you, sh can you tell us a little bit more about that? So when you're evaluating someone who presents or if you're asked to do a consult for someone who's, who's having consequences in their life, what does an evaluation look like? Well, it looks like talk therapy, but very pointed to what exactly are your problems. And people will say any number of things from, um, you know, chronic affairs, uh, strip clubs, sexual massage parlors are hugely popular for men today. Um, escorts, cam girls, um, any kind of internet activity with sex and sexuality. For women, it may look like serial monogamy. Um, or a lot of anonymous sex or sex with married men, et cetera. Um, so we want to know what the presenting problem is first. And then, of course, where it started, we're looking for escalation, um, how it's really gotten out of control. And then what are the consequences? Because the consequences and the criteria are often the same. Mm -hmm. um, loss of jobs, loss of relationships, loss of friendships, hobbies, um, always um, making excuses for where you are, keeping an open calendar in case you get a better offer. Um, so there are consequences um, that people are very clear about um, that are taking place in their lives. Makes sense. And then you you talk about in, in you know you have some amazing um, information on the public domain and YouTube. Your lectures are recorded, and would recommend our listeners look you up because wow, what what an informational wealth you have put out there. It's wonderful, but. Can you talk a little bit about classic versus contemporary sex addiction and where you move on when evaluating and how we approach people with, with sex sure. addiction? Well, you know, with the advent of the internet, we saw people's sex addiction and porn addictions spike, like straight up the side of a cliff. Um, and we started looking at the difference between sex addiction and porn addiction because there are plenty of porn addicts that don't have sex with other people. Um, and plenty of sex addicts, meaning people that have sex with other people that aren't that interested in porn or they'll watch porn, they'll masturbate to it, but it's not really their jam. And they're not doing it compulsively or to the point of injury. So a couple of scholars looked at this problem and they identified and made a distinction between contemporary and classic. So classic porn addiction is really where my um, interest has been in expertise and looking at these early childhood attachment issues really that harken back sometimes to the third trimester of pregnancy or infancy, where you've got massive dysregulation, you know, in the mother's body that she is essentially handing down to the infant and later uh, the child who's not getting their needs met contingently, not being properly regulated, attuned to, and cared for. And so a dysregulated child will eventually find something to make itself feel better, whether it's drug, alcohol, sex, uh, you name it. Um, so this is what we consider more classic sex addiction, that there is, a, um, there is a etiology or an original wound, if you will, that started this ball rolling a long time ago. So it's not just a psychological problem. There are neurobiological substrates to this problem the way their nervous system was, quote, wired, so to speak. So if somebody's extremely anxious or extremely depressed or has a mood disorder and they learned early on that if they masturbated, it made them feel better, it makes good sense that that became a coping mechanism. And that then escalates with, you know, availability to sexual material, which is everywhere now. And the contemporary sex addict, on the other hand, becomes anxious and depressed as a result of using pornography. So because they're using porn and they're isolating and they um, have become more avoidant than maybe they were to begin with, they have less contact with people um, and their anxiety and depression is going up as a result of the pornography usage. Um, that can sometimes be much easier to treat if these are habituated patterns, not deeper 
trauma or deeper defenses in the body, if you will. And we see this, and there are forums all over the internet for young men, especially that are addicted to porn that want to stop. Um, there's a group called um, No Fap, which is on Reddit that Alexander Rhodes started, um, and Gabe Deems Reboot Nation, another young male that started a group online forum for young men to support each other to stop masturbating to porn. So there are no therapists or doctors around. They're just a bunch of guys that say, hey, we're doing this too much and we want to stop. That's so interesting because it obviously we deal a lot or work with a lot of folks who have substance use disorder. And there's this age old conflict between is this is this really self-medicating, which kind of the American Society of Addiction has said, well, this is not really a thing. You know, addiction is a brain disease and it's primary. And then you have the consequences of substance use, which anxiety, depression, and all of those things. Or is it primary? Uh, you have primary trauma, anxiety, depression leading to consequences. So I guess it's just both are true and, and yes. it's true for sex addiction as well. Yeah, because everybody's so different. Sex addiction is like trying to treat an eating disorder. It's not, you know, AA where you just put the plug in the jug, mm. right? It's just not that black and white or that simple. Every human being presents with a different constellation of how they came to be, you know, ensnarled or um, held hostage by sex and sexuality. And they're painful stories. And for some people, it's easier to unwind than it is for others, depending on what other issues they might be dealing with. So, for example, if you have a, a client who's struggling with ADHD, that's a particular subtype of what we call sex addiction. Um, because they're always looking for something new and shiny. So is it that they're sex addicts or they have ADHD? But when the two come together and then you add an amphetamine, maybe like Adderall to that, you can have a very big mess and a big addiction. That is fascinating because I treated a patient recently with exactly that problem. <laughs> so yeah, that was really interesting. Can you just tell us a little bit about the prevalence of sex addiction disorders, like how common is it? And some of these myths, because you talked about this classically just gets defined that this is predominantly just men, but mm -hmm. I know you treat men and women yeah. and it's just in common. You talked a little bit about some of the behaviors, the differences between some of the men and women, but how, so a little bit of the prevalence and then like, sh how do we screen for it? Because we see sometimes a lot of this comorbidity mm -hmm. with substance use in sex addiction sure. and I encountered this very early in my career and then kind of felt like wow I really missed this it was kind of going on and didn't see this with my patient and really does affect their life yeah it's hard to nail down the prevalence because there haven't been great studies or statistics on this it's estimated to be one to three percent of the population um, but that's an old estimation from 2007, I think. Um, and so it's very difficult to tell. Um, all I know <clears throat> is that Center for Healthy Sex has been around since 2005 and going strong. So um, we're all seeing this wash up on our shores. And I think that's the good news and bad news about the proliferation of internet pornography. On the one hand, it opened the doors for people to see that they weren't alone, that they weren't quote freaks, that their sexual interests were shared by other people and also encouraged people to experiment with pleasure. That sex isn't just about or healthy sex about um, the absence of disease or dysfunction, but it's about what kind of pleasure am I experiencing? How am I growing myself as an adult and my sexuality over time and over the lifespan? So there's really been a lot of education, but the problem is just that also is that we don't have any sex education in this country to speak of. There is nothing just like with eating and food and nutrition that's codified and shared so that we're raising sexually healthy children. So everybody's learning about sex from porn or from their friends, which I shudder to think, you know, 14 year olds educating each other on sexual health. And that creates this whole host of problem that we're having and that we're seeing even between genders and the struggles that people are having with sex and sexuality. So that is something I would like to see change massively in our culture and also would love to see some kind of parental controls 
um, so that parents can opt in or opt out of internet pornography so their children are protected. And this is, you know, something I think we're going to battle for a very long time because the porn industry is such a huge industry. At the last time I saw statistics on this, it's like a $97 billion industry, one of the most prolific industries in the world. So with that kind of muscle and money, it's going to be very difficult to get any kind of control on this. It's a free for all. You know, a five-year-old can see hardcore, violent, denigrating pornography, which, as you both know, is a form of abuse and trauma. So I've had patients that started looking at porn as early as five, eight years old. And I think the average age now is eight years old for children watching Internet pornography. So that may, they may as well be looking at, you know, dead bodies. That's how gruesome it is for a child that age. So that's a big chunk of what we're up against here, lack of education and lack of parental control um, around internet porn usage. And it's starting at a very early age with brains that are unmyelinated. And you're right, you add drugs and alcohol to that. And wow, you've got a real problem. Yeah, you say in, in your lecture that the internet's a cornucopia of perversity. I love that. I'm like, that is that is very true. <laughs> it's quotable. And it's terrible. <laughs> this is kind of devastating. So, you know, the, especially in the context of other trauma that people yes. are exposed to. So they're vulnerable, like you said, to the effect of being sucked in. Yeah. I mean, if you've got a child that comes from an abusive family and they're already dissociative, uh, right. And they find Internet porn and then it, it looks like a community or another way of being. It creates further distortion. It dives them deeper into the trauma, doesn't help them out of it. But it's soothing because there's nobody else available to them. And you can you talk about, uh, you know, the neuro chemical aspect of this and of course people who are interested in addiction science are familiar with some of this but you know the dopamine serotonin interplay in the you know in your prefrontal cortex and ventral mm -hmm. mental area these areas of the brain that are highly associated with reward and seeking and fear i think this is um really interesting well you know i think uh, don hilton donald hilton is a, a medical doctor in at the university of texas talks about how um, internet pornography and um, gaming addiction are exactly the same. They are both intermittent reward-seeking behaviors. Um, oh, he's talking about gambling, online gambling. They're both intermittent reward-seeking behaviors that absolutely affect the dopaminergic system, the mesolimbic dopaminergic system. Um, and so they're excitatory. One is monetary, one is masturbatory, one's in the DSM, and one is not. Right. Again, so why is that? But it is highly, uh, quote, addictive. And that's why Patrick Carnes thinks of it as an addiction, because of what's happening in the brain, that we have our own little neurochemical chemistry set that we can tweak. And I've thought about this, and I don't know what you guys think about this, that when you have a child who is not attuned to contingently um, from infancy and childhood, and they already have low dopamine tone. You know, if you hug that child, um, they're limp, their limbs are limp, their bodies limp. Um, they don't get very excited about things. They don't celebrate things. There's not an experience of joy because that's never been upregulated by the mother um, early on. When they find a dopamine um, excitatory prospect, whether it's sex or gambling or gaming, that's going to feel incredible to them because they feel alive, because they feel so dead internally. That's one presentation there. Um, and I think about even, this is super corny, but it's Christmas. And so having a Christmas tree, when I open my door, there's a little dopamine pop because there's something new and shiny and smelly in my house that wasn't there a week ago. So dopamine loves novelty. And it doesn't matter whether it is, whether it's shopping or eating pastries at this time of year and chocolates, which you don't normally do because that's also excitatory. We all seek it. It's part of the seeking system, which originates in the brainstem and every single mammal has. So the problem is, can we regulate 
our impulses, and that goes back to the executive function that you were pointing to, Paula, do we have the capacity and the hardware to regulate those impulses so we know when to stop, when enough is enough? Okay, I've had enough chocolates today. I bought enough Christmas gifts. I'm done, uh, right? Um, as opposed to people that don't have those um, capacities available to them because of trauma and because of abuse. So does that speak to Yeah, the, that saying? does. Absolutely. So in addition to that question, so intergenerational trauma, what if you have children who are born in relatively, into relatively stable homes and they're nurtured in a loving and supportive way and given good skills to manage their own lives, but they are their parents were not. And you talk about intergenerational trauma, how this can affect a child that's otherwise quite health, should be quite healthy emotionally and able to regulate. Mm. Well, the way I understand it is that we're talking about epigenetic factors, the way the genes actually express themselves. So if you have a mother who comes from a very anxious household as a child and she's done her therapy and then she has a baby she's going to likely revert to that original regulatory style, which is she's going to be anxious and all thumbs. And if she doesn't get help from a baby nurse or doula or her partner isn't particularly regulated, that anxiety is being encoded in the autonomic nervous system of the infant. The infant is resonating because there is a deep synchronicity that's taking place between the mother and the infant through eye contact, touch, gesture, facial expressions, tone of voice. So the mother is literally, I hate to use this word, but sort of downloading her regulatory capacities into this infant system. And that is the intergenerational transmission. Likewise, if the mother is depressed and she doesn't make eye contact or she has a still face and that infant is looking for some sort of uh, affect, regulation, um, some sort of play state, and the mother doesn't meet that, that self, that nascent self in the infant at its extreme explodes or implodes internally. And then you have all kinds of uh, problems. This is why now it's thought that borderline personality disorder is formed in two months, that you can diagnose infants at two months based on what's happening between the mother and infant. Whereas narcissistic personality is formed later, the senior toddler around the, you know, later than 18 months, two to three years, when um, the child is not being met contingently by the mother. So we are very, very delicate creatures. We're also incredibly strong. Um, we are neurobiologically encoded to be set up in a particular way. So this isn't some opinion, this is in all of the mental health, infant mental health literature, and certainly all of the regulation theory literature that we have now. Um, and we see this is what human beings need in order to be formed and forged securely and appropriately. And when it goes sideways, it's extremely difficult and painful. Um, and I think the good news is, is we have... Um, you know, the field of psychology has been growing by leaps and bounds, and we have so many therapies to help people um, become integrated, become neurally integrated, so they can um, earn a secure attachment. And we don't learn about those in medicine. I mean, we, we may right. learn about them, like we know that our therapy colleagues are you know, doing ART or EMDR, mm -hmm. or we may have heard about mind-body techniques. And but unfortunately, classically trained physicians, as you know, I know you yeah. know this, we don't get this kind of training. So mm -hmm. if you could tell us a little bit about the treatment for sex addiction, or if you want anything sure. more about the manifestations and consequences, but treatment, and then especially from like, I guess we have the bias of medical lens, uh -huh. um, what we could employ and recommend to our patients, obviously, they're going to, we refer them to treatment, but what we can do as well. Sure. Well, I want to answer Darlene's questions about drugs and alcohol, um, and missing that diagnostically. So, I have had many, many patients over the year that come into sex addiction treatment after 10, 15, 20 years in AA, right? But they've been acting out sexually the whole time. So they were never really emotionally sober. They were chemically sober. So in the S programs, the saying is that this is the last stop. 
that people in sex addiction recovery recognize that this is the core issue because it is an attachment issue and a regulatory issue. So uh, people were drinking for a whole host of reasons and they act out sexually for a whole host of reasons, mostly because they cannot regulate themselves and they need something external to make themselves feel better. So we do see um, these co-occurring addictions Sometimes they're multiple addictions, sometimes they're cross addictions, meaning a person doesn't do one without the other. Like there are plenty of guys that don't do cocaine unless they hire prostitutes, right? The prostitute brings the cocaine and that's when they use the drug. Um, so, or they drink alcohol and then they, you know, maybe cross dress, but they wouldn't cross dress unless they were disinhibited. So it can show up in many different ways, but if you're treating um, substance use disorders, it's really important to ask people about their sex life. Tell me about sex and sexuality. And especially this question, not do you look at porn, but how much porn do you look at? Because everybody looks at internet porn today. Um, I think there was a, an attempt to do a study with young males, you know, because they do them in university settings and they couldn't find a control group. Right? That's great. <laughs> I know it's, it's funny, but it's not so funny. So the question is, how much porn do you look at? How often are you looking at it? And how much time, what is the duration of time? So if your average male is looking at internet porn, I don't know, three to four times a week and masturbating, um, you know, for five or 10 minutes, and that's just part of his routine, that's probably pretty quote normal. But when somebody is doing it, you know, daily, they're doing it to the extent that they're missing work or school obligations or family obligations. Uh, they're masturbating to the point of injury uh, with females also, especially that's a question to ask. Then you know that you've got somebody who's much more compulsive and that can be really on the OCD spectrum. Um, when somebody is masturbating to the point of injury, that is extreme. You want to think about um, obsessive compulsive disorder. And that's when it's more on the compulsive spectrum, not on the addictive spectrum. So you can see there are all these iterations um, and manifestations of this thing. So don't, I would say if people are treating substance use disorders, that you should absolutely add this question to every other question that you ask. Otherwise, you're going to be doing a person a disservice. Um, the other thing we know is that people that get into recovery from drugs and alcohol often lose their sobriety because of their sex and love addiction issues. They hook up with somebody in treatment or they start dating too early or some guy, you know, breaks my heart and then boom, I'm using again because really I'm also a love addict, which, you know, my therapists are missing which is, you know, I'm in fantasy about people. I'm not in actual reality about them. So these are important questions to ask. That's really helpful. And I love what you talked about because you have patients who are either, like you said, co-using or they are switching one for the other two. Is it common... And I don't know like what the statistics are, but is it common that you will have a patient who when one, they seem to get sober off of some of their like substance use, so alcohol use disorder or their opiate use disorder, and then you will see their sex addiction get worse? Or is it that we have just as their physician been missing that the whole time? It can be. Um... You know, for some people that are multiply addicted, it's a game of whack-a-mole, right? You stop one addiction and then sense. boom, the sex pops up. They stop their sex addiction. They start eating. I had a client who was alcoholic. He stopped drinking and he came in one day and I said, how was your weekend? And he said, I ate a German chocolate cake. I was like, what? And then I realized he was craving sugar. Of course he ate an entire German chocolate cake. <laughs> This was a tall, thin, wiry guy, right? So, so there it is. So we have to be astute and be on the lookout for what else might this person be engaging in in order to 
manage themselves. And I, and I yeah. started to say manage their mood, but they are, they're trying to regulate. These are auto regulatory strategies yeah. because they don't know how to reach out to other people, which is what the program's about making a call, going to a meeting fellowship. You know, there are studies that show that um, Alcoholics Anonymous changes people's attachment style over time. And why is that? Because people caring about people, People saying, call me, or let's go for a walk, or let's go have a meal together. How are you doing? Right? That caring, that human connection is what people need in order to start regulating that they can get their needs met from other people. And when you grow up in a family where you can't get your needs met, and you're a smart kid, and you figure out you have to do it yourself, you get very creative about what the do-it-yourself job is. Um, so get learning to trust people again is a big part of recovery, um, which is similar to your uh, question, Paula. Um, so where treatment is concerned, um, what I've written about, because I saw the um, sort of the folly in this, I saw psychodynamic and psychoanalytic therapists doing more affective work um, and getting to family of origin issues first. And while they were doing that, the client was acting out like crazy. They were not abating the sexual behaviors. Um, and then there are CBT therapists that just focus on containment and stopping the behavior, but they don't do the deeper work. So one is symptom reducing and the other we're looking for um, long-term change and growth. So I've synthesized you know, a lot of people's work and my, I privilege stopping the behavior first using a cognitive behavioral model that says, let's look at what you're doing, no matter how shameful it is. Um, and let's look at how you're going to stop doing what you're doing and what are you willing to commit to? Because this has to be a collaboration. It's your life. It's your sexuality. I'm not a moral authority, but if these are the things that you categorically want to stop doing, then let's make a list of those things. And then what supports do you need to stop doing them? Whether it's internet filters, getting rid of your smartphone and getting a flip phone, um, changing your phone number um, so people can't call you, um, cutting certain people, blocking phone numbers out of your life, uh, things of that nature agreeing not to drive down certain streets or go into certain neighborhoods. So very concrete behavioral things that people can do to feel safe. And then adding in group therapy, 12-step meetings if people are willing to go to it. So they have a community of concern. I've never seen anybody get sober from sex addiction by themselves. I don't think they can do it. You just can't do it. You need other people to help you. That's interesting because I, how much does, I mean, how much does shame play into accessing? Well, you already said that people are really sick and hurting by the time they present yeah. for care, they really are looking for treatment because they're suffering, but how much does shame keep people silent in this, in this process? Hugely. And how do, yeah. Does it interfere with that ability to, if the treatment is the opposite of isolation mm -hmm. and, and you know, shame, then how do you encourage that? I mean, that's just part of the treatment plan is to really encourage that. Well, I, um, you know, if people are completely resistant to that, I let them try to do it in individual therapy, but eventually they slip mm -hmm. and they can't do it by themselves. So some people have to learn by doing, other people will take people's advice. So it depends on the person, but what I have the luxury of doing at my treatment center is calling or asking one of the men in one of my groups um, if they would be willing to take a newcomer to a meeting or take a phone call. So I will broker those relationships as anonymously as possible um, in the spirit of the fellowship, um, because shame is the cause and effect of sex addiction, in my opinion. It's the engine that drives the thing. The sex addiction itself is traumatizing and creates more shame. And then talking about it is incredibly embarrassing and painful and difficult. But when the therapist is comfortable and grounded in this language and not afraid to hear anything um, and not judgmental about it, that starts to reduce shame. Then when people can go to a meeting and hear other people's stories that have done the same thing that they've done, um, and that they've done something, you know, not as bad or as bad or worse than the next person, then, you know, they realize, as it says in the big book, we're all in this life raft together. 
right? Nobody's better, or worse. We all have our issues. We're all human beings. And I remind people that we don't hate people. We hate the behavior because they hurt other people, but we don't hate you. We love you. We're here to help you. Um, and so that is, uh, Paula, a good question because that can be the sticking point for people getting help. That is such good advice, though. I really love that. Yeah. You talked earlier about when you're looking at some compulsive behaviors, is there any role for medication SSRIs when you're looking at that kind of OCD spectrum? Yes. Do we use them anywhere else or just in that world? Any other medications you would ever recommend that patients be see a physician for? Sure. Um, the way I like to think about it just clinically is when somebody comes in, there's an assessment process for probably the first couple of weeks while we're getting a picture of what's going on, making treatment recommendations. If that person can follow those treatment recommendations, meaning they're willing to read a book, do the homework, bring it back, talk about it. They're making a plan. They're staying sober on the plan, um, but they're taking the resources given to them. That's a really good sign. If somebody is struggling, I have to ask myself, why does it make sense that they're struggling? What are they struggling with? With somebody who has a compulsive problem like OCD, you know, the classic SSRIs are enormously helpful. I had a client who was masturbating to pornography every day and in his car and couldn't stop. And he was put on a therapeutic dose of Prozac. And guess what? It stopped. Right? So was he an addict? Was he OCD? Now, the question is, why pornography? Why not stamps? Uh, why wasn't he collecting other things? <laughs> um, so he could use some help around sex and sexuality, obviously. With other people, um, if depression or anxiety are in their way, then they can use some internal support. And for those people, it may not be a lifelong sentence of an SSRI. It may be for a year. So they have enough internal support that they can tolerate their feelings and doing the work they need to do or their social anxiety getting to meetings. Um, you know, I noticed also that you had a podcast on gabapentin abuse, which was sort of chilling uh, because that's been a medication that's been incredibly helpful to people. A little bit's gone a long way for sex addicts um, just to cut the edge off of their anxiety. And then also I've seen antipsychotics very helpful to people that are more um, fragmented, that were horribly abused, um, that have a very punitive self-structure, um, that a tiny bit of that can go a very long way for people too. So I think when the psychiatrist is discerning about these things and really thinking about who is this person what is their therapist saying? How are they able to maintain sobriety? Not like what's their actual struggle? And you can pinpoint it. Medication's a god or goddess scent, whatever you believe in. <laughs> in your case, is goddess scent. <laughs> and how about have you seen people? Well, gabapentin. I, we, I find like I know Darlene would agree, but we find it enormously helpful for many people with substance yeah. use. Just unfortunately. It, we talked about that risk, but how have you seen people react favorably to medications like naltrexone or medications that affect the glutaminergic system like topiramate or some of the other anticonvulsants? Um, yes, to both of those. And I don't typically make that recommendation. I let the psychiatrist and I leave that to psychiatry. I'll just report what I see the clinical picture I see, what the person's struggling with. Like, it doesn't make sense. This guy is going to meetings all the time. He works a program. He's highly insightful. Um, but when his anxiety comes to the foreground, he just can't handle it at all. And he goes and acts out. And then afterwards, he's in a rage and he's in shame. Um, and all of this is at the core of his trauma, which really has to be dealt with through you know, deeper psychotherapy. But in the meantime, if he's not maintaining sobriety, it's demoralizing, right? And maybe he's spending loads of money on sex workers also. So how do we help him? What does he need to get out of this hole? And that's where I think a collaboration is incredibly important between psychotherapist and psychiatrist. Right. 
What what else do we need to know? What else haven't we covered? Well, there were a quest, few questions you yeah. asked. There are some online tests that are self-report measures. One of them is called the sex addiction screening test. Um, I think it's maybe 25 or 30 questions. Um, and it asks you some basic questions that, and it indicates, you know, if you have five or more of these checked, yes, you may have a problem. You should seek assessment. Um, and the other one is the love addiction screening test. Um, Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous have what their famous 40 questions. So you can look at that to see if you're struggling with love addiction as well. So there are little tools online that people can look at if they think they have a problem. You know, usually if you think you have a problem, you have a problem. You don't, if you don't think you have a problem, you're not really thinking about it. <laughs> um, so um, that I think is usually a tip off for people to also pay attention to self-deception and how that can trick us into thinking we don't have a problem, even though we're having messes in our lives. So those little screening tests are helpful for everybody as well. In terms of online resources, so for people who practice in a resource scarce area, um, do you recommend a certain, I mean, Love and Sex Anonymous, you said? Sure. As an online group, or what else would you recommend? Well, the fellowship is called Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, S-L-A-A, and then there's Sex Addicts Anonymous, S-A-A. Um, all of these fellowships can be found online. Centerforhealthysex.com is my, our website, and we have a lot of resources, as you mentioned. Um, you can call anytime, and an intake counselor uh, will pick up the phone and talk to you no matter where in the world you are and help you find a therapist or resources in your area. Um, and we offer online coaching classes that are 12 weeks long for sex addiction, love addiction, for partners of sex addicts. Um, so if you are struggling and you live in an area where you don't have access to therapy, we can really help you get your recovery on track and make a plan and direct you to the right books to read and help you find the right 12-step fellowships also, and even help you find a therapist in your, at least your state that you can Zoom with now. That's a wonderful resource, really. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And also, what about your book? Tell us quickly about your books before we go so people can read more about your work. Well, those books are also at centerforhealthysex.com or Amazon if you Google my name. But um, the book that we mostly talked about today is part of the Norton series on interpersonal neurobiology. Uh, it's called Sex Addiction as, as Affect Dysregulation because I see it as a problem, as a regulatory problem. And um, I wrote this for clinicians, but many lay people are interested enough to take a deeper dive. So I'm looking at an integrated um, treatment protocol that, again, is both addressing cognitive behavioral issues and also deeper trauma work. And then I have a book that's enormously popular called Mirror of Intimacy, which was really a... Um, you know, a project that was a project uh, that I love doing. And um, that is a book of daily reflections on emotional and erotic intelligence. That's the subtitle. And it's all about sex and sexuality and healthy sex and sexuality. So it's a daily reader. Um, we have three little healthy sex acts on that, that you can put into practice every day. And then I do um, offer a free monthly webinar on a topic every month that you can tune into or that you can hear on our YouTube channel at Center for Healthy Sex. So those are a couple of the books that you can turn to. Thank you. That's wonderful. I was telling, I, I, I probably emailed your <laughs> YouTube link to like five of my colleagues oh, wow. in the last couple of days. I'm like, you have to watch this right Thank away. <laughs> Send it to all your fellows and residents. This is amazing. <laughs> That's mind blowing. Great. So Really, thank you so much. Really enlightening. And we really appreciate you being on, on the show. Thank you both. It was nice to meet both of you. And I appreciate you for the work that you're doing and um, the incredible resource that you're providing mm -hmm. with people. Thank you so much. Until next time. Hey, check us out at theaddictionfiles.com or email us at theaddictionfiles at gmail.com. Thank you so much to Ricky Valides for use of his song, Awake. Check him out at rickyvalides.com.
entertainment and education purposes only. Hosts and guests are not responsible for any harm caused by information obtained from this source. As each person is unique, you are advised to seek the advice of your own healthcare professional to treat any medical conditions you may be having. Opinions expressed on the show are those of the addiction files and not of our respective employers.